And now you've got people, journalists from lots of different networks, notably the one that I heard that probably has been repeated the most, like Don Lemon, trying to suggest, just like they did in the wake of the New Life synagogue that was shot up earlier in Pittsburgh, happened last year. When they talk about white supremacy, which is a real problem, being on the rise, and they talk about this happening, they want to at least give kind of partial blame or vaguely sort of insinuate that somehow Donald Trump is behind it. That's what they want to do. And Don Lemon is no exception, saying that uh, he thinks that Donald Trump's call to Rabbi Goldstein was insincere. For those of you who didn't hear it, and, and that was something that occurred earlier on the Ben Shapiro show on News Radio 1440, the, the rabbi had said it earlier this week. What he was saying is that the call that he received from President Trump in the wake of this attack, and remember, this is the rabbi that was protecting his grandson and protecting his family and lost one of his fingers and got injured in this shooting. He said that the president's call to him was so incredibly comforting. And what really struck me about this is that when he spoke to him, he said, it wasn't just that it was a president of the United States talking to me. You could tell it was somebody that empathized with me and shared my pain. Now, look, I can't see into Donald Trump's heart. I can't. But based on the way that the rabbi recanted that story, or not recanted, regaled us with that story, the way that he came out and explained how that took place, and you can hear the man and the emotion in his voice, I just don't believe that that was insincere. Does Donald Trump mess, mess up a lot? Yes. Does he say things that are insensitive and offensive a lot? Yeah, he does. But unless he just completely snowed this guy, and unless he was just incredibly convincing, I don't believe that call was insincere. I don't. And of course, Lemon's reasoning behind that is he claims that it was because, well, Trump's really an anti-Semite. That's what he kind of suggests. And part of his rationale is because of Charlottesville. And admittedly, and I've gone over this 10,000 times, Yes, Donald Trump did a stupid thing when talking about Charlottesville and saying that there were fine people on both sides. Yeah, that was a dumb thing. We got it. Move on. Are you really suggesting that the guy who moved the embassy and showed more political courage than any of our previous presidents since my lifetime when it came to Israel, that the guy that moved the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem which was a very clear sign on the world stage that the United States supports Israel and stands firm with them against her enemies. And the man that also has a Jewish son-in-law and a daughter that converted to Judaism with her husband and this same father, Donald Trump, who became father-in-law to this Jewish man is not only just someone that tolerates him being in his family, but made him a top White House advisor, which granted may not have been a good idea, but just because of Kushner's ability, not because of his lineage. You're really trying to tell me that that guy secretly hates Jews. Come on. You got to do better than that. And remember that this is the same left that swears up and down that Ilhan Omar is not an anti-Semite. The one that supports the boycotting of Israel and says that Jews have hypnotized the world and saying that the Jews are a force for evil and insinuating that Jews that are loyal to Israel have dual loyalty and are really traitors to America. That person's not an anti-Semite. But the guy that moved the embassy to Jerusalem and has a Jewish son-in-law and a Jewish daughter, he's the anti-Semite. I don't know if they just really think Americans are that stupid or they know that because nobody's going to call them out on their crap that they just say whatever they want and know that there's no repercussions for them. But either way, I don't see how you could even come close to making that case. Trump has a lot of flaws. He is a very flawed individual. I'm quick to point out those flaws on this program on a regular basis. 
but I see no evidence for him being an anti-Semite, and I see a mountain of evidence to the contrary. If anything, he's the most Jewish-friendly president we have had since Reagan. And I'm not saying that to disparage any of the previous presidents as anti-Semites. I'm just saying that he's the most pro-Israel, pro-Jewish president we have had in my entire generation. Since the millennials have been around, he's the most pro-Jewish president we've had. You can't make the case to me that he's sympathetic to people that kill Jews. And to suggest, as Don Lemon did, that Donald Trump's rhetoric is giving a license to these people is absolutely insane. And it's even more insane when you consider, and you look into this guy's writings, that he himself didn't like Donald Trump. That the, the shooter in the synagogue said he was not a Donald Trump fan. And guess what? Most white supremacists aren't for the reasons that I just laid out. I remember Vox did that interview in Charlottesville where they talked to one of the guys that was one of the group leaders for the alt-right and the Nazi march. And he said, I like some of the things that Donald Trump has done, but there's no way that somebody like Donald, we need somebody that's far more anti-Jew than Donald Trump. How could he let his daughter marry a Jewish man? So when they actually do encounter these white nationalists, they don't like Trump either. That's something that the left and the white nationalists have in common. Nonetheless, they're continuing to say that. And frankly, I'm just so sick. And I mean really sick. Of constantly dissecting tragedies to try to figure out how this proves our point. I mean, you feel as though, and I say this as somebody that is an observer of news, and watches it constantly. You feel as though when one of these tragedies comes out, and it happens on both sides, I'm not saying it's just on the left, that the details of the story start trickling in, and the first question on a lot, maybe not all, but a lot of the media's mind, is how does this play towards our narrative? And they look at each other, and they plan out their segments. And they're trying to figure out, okay, how do we make this work in our favor? What kind of gun did he use? Did he use a gun at all, or was this a bombing? What religion is he? What political affiliations did he have? And I'm not saying that we don't need to talk about that. I'm not saying that those things are not important to help us understand why this took place. But Ted Gummit, it feels like that's the only thing that we do now. And I do think there's some lessons to be learned from some of the shootings. I'm not saying that we can't draw anything from them, but I'm tired of the first reaction always being, all right, well, it seems like, okay, this guy was using a gun, but it wasn't a gun that we really want to ban right now. So we won't really focus on that. What we're going to do is we're going to focus on the fact that this guy really hated Muslims, and we're going to use that as a way to kind of wedge against our political opponents and say that, well, this proves that their rhetoric is causing all this death and destruction and they're terrible people, and maybe we can use that to win the next election. For goodness sake, are there not more important things to worry about at that point? Can we not let the families grieve, at least for a little bit, or wait until the bodies get cold before we try to use the death of their loved ones as political fodder? Please. Is that too much to ask? Because I don't think it is. I don't think it's too much to ask that the families have to deal with watching the news coverage of their family members being brutally murdered, whether it was being shot or bombed or whatever it was, to, for Pete's sake, not try to use that tragedy to win the next election or to try to get a policy proposal that you want through. And yes, it happens on both sides. I'm old enough to remember when Donald Trump saw the truck, uh, you remember when the truck ran over people in New York and tried to use that as a way to push his Muslim ban. It happens on both sides. I get that. But it's wrong no matter who does it. And frankly, I'm sick of us seeing these tragedies and pulling out the details and saying, all right, which ones support the narrative that we like? Okay, that helps us. That helps us. That doesn't. We're going to focus on these two. We're going to run with that. Maybe we'll be able to get this new policy through. 
Maybe we can get the Senate to vote on that if we present the story this way and turn public opinion this way. Are we not better than this? I got to tell you, for the longest time, for the longest time, I was really convinced that people that didn't pay attention to the news were just lazy and didn't want to deal with it. And that if this country was going to be saved, it was going to be saved by the people that actually do pay a lot of attention to the news and, and try to, I got to be honest, I'm worried about that now because I think I was wrong. And I'm wondering, because I think that the average person that doesn't spend a lot of time on this and doesn't have a career in it like I do, I think they're watching this and they're watching how everybody just tries to pick apart the story and take the certain details out that they want, that pushes the narrative that they like. That they see how people do that and they turn even something that should be somber like this horrific shooting that took place against people just for believing what they believed and genetically being who they were just happened to have Jewish blood in their veins. And because of that, some psychopath thought that it was okay for him to kill them. And they see people in the media extrapolate the little tidbits of the story that helps their narrative and think it makes their candidates more likely to win and focus on that and fight with each other about it. And they see that and they're like, you know what? I'm done. It's, it's too much. I'm just going to take care of my family and do, you know, do my job and all of that. I'm just going to ignore all this junk that is constantly happening because it doesn't help anybody. And I got to be honest at this point, looking at this and seeing it happen over and over and over again, I don't blame them. If we want people to be more involved in the civil discourse, if we want people to be more involved in politics, whether it's local or federal, maybe what we need to do is be more cautious in how we handle the news. And I'm not saying that you don't ever do anything controversial or you don't try to draw lessons out of stories like this. I'm just saying maybe a shift in priority would be healthy here. And try to remember that not everything should be used as a political club to beat your opponents over the head. And maybe, maybe if we remember that, maybe we'll be doing a lot better as a country as a whole. Now, I know you're here because you're interested in information on what's going on in the state of Alabama and around the world, and you've come to the right place for that. But it's YouTube, so you could also just be here because you're bored. If you want me to keep making videos to keep you occupied, you need to go ahead and like and subscribe. Otherwise, you're going to have to go back to playing Minesweeper.